Hey everyone, welcome to the final video that I'm going to do on my Pokemon themed game. In this video, we're going to do one of the most important things aside from programming and developing the game. We're going to make sure that our game is optimized and that it will run on a multitude of platforms. So we're going to profile, we're going to build, and we're going to wrap our game up. Let's get to it. So the first thing that I want to do in this video is something we should have actually been doing all along because whenever Ryder is throwing up a warning, we want to address it and see what's going on and just optimize our code as we're writing stuff because that will help us with debugging. So let's have a look at that and just take a quick look at how these things actually work when you put it in practice. So in this case, it's a very simple script that we have. This is our start screen manager and we have three warnings. So the first one is about using a directive that is not required by the code. So you can right click it and jump to the source and then Rider will take you right there. You can just double click it as well actually. And then you'll see this little warning action list. So if you click on that, you can have Rider do whatever is needed to be done to fix this. So in this case, it's remove the unused directives in the file. Well, this basically means that we're not using these namespaces, so we might as well delete them. So let's just remove them and that will take care of that warning for us. Let's move on to the next one. So in the next one here, we have an issue with invoking this method blink call to action. You can see that Rider is actually highlighting it with this with this wavy underline in green. So that's telling me like, this is not a great thing to do, but it's not really a warning and it's not an error whatsoever. You can absolutely use this. So the one thing you wanna do though, is you wanna make sure you put your cursor where it needs to be because then that light will light up and you can click on it then. And if you have no idea what writer is suggesting here, you can click on, where is it? Um, go to inspection and then click on why is writer suggesting this. And then it'll tell you why it's suggest suggesting this. So in this case, um, the inspection suggests that you use a new feature of C Sharp 6.0 and implement it that way. And you'll just be writing better code that way. So like, okay, now I don't know C Sharp 6.0 that well, maybe, right? So what do I have to do here, Writer? Well, you can just, again, click on this and then see what Writer is suggesting. In this case, Writer wants us to use the name off expression. Still, I have no idea what. Let's just click it. And Ryder has now changed our string to name of blink call to action. And our code is completely free of warnings at this point. So that's great. We can save our code now. And maybe it's not a bad idea to have a look if everything still is working. And going back to our Unity editor, I muted the sound here because we have that very loud theme song playing right now. But we can see that this is still blinking. So even though the code is different from what I have been typing, it has been resolved or that warning has been resolved in a way that doesn't impact everything. And we have cleaner code that is more in line with the standards. So that is what Rider helps us to do with all of these warnings. And I invite you to just go through the warnings at this point that are in the project and see what you can come up with that could use changes. You can pause the video here to do so. And I'm gonna do the same thing myself, but here are a couple of things that I ran into that were actually quite interesting. In our GUI manager, we have three warnings that are pretty much about naming variables. So the first one is related to us not respecting the coding standard or the naming standards for private instance fields. So you don't want to use a second capital um, after one another. So instead of timer GB, you want to have timer G and then a small B, which refers to group box. You could disable this warning pretty easily. Like if we click here and then we go here, and then under the inspection, we could disable the detection rules for it once with a comment in this case, but I'm actually fine with just changing this and Ryder will change it for us throughout this entire file. Next up, there is a variable here called time that is hiding an already pre-existing label called GUI manager dot time. It's part of the GUI manager class through mono behavior that we have. So it's not ideal and we want to rename this thing. So again, Ryder can help us out with that. We can just click in here, click on the rename parameter. And in case of time, we can just call it report time because it's the time that we want to report. So there you go. And Rider will change it throughout. This time it's changed down here as well and we don't have to worry about it. Next up, a minor issue. We have a condition with if and else that we could turn into pretty much a one line condition by converting it to the question mark colon expression. So if I click on this, convert on operator, we have the exact same code 
Uh, we are checking the Boolean, then seeing if it's true or not, and according, uh, adjusting accordingly. So it's a one line of code that did what we were doing there with multiple lines of code. And it's just a lot easier to get through our code um, without having to get so much text. Finally, there's a typo in the identifier level manager. I like the way I did that. I don't want that to be changed. So what I'm gonna do on this one is I'm gonna go to the inspection, disable once with comment, just click on that and resharp or disable one's identifier typo. So we don't have to worry about it anymore. And with that, our GUI manager is completely free of warnings. Moving on to the level manager then, I already did the first pass, but the ones that I quickly wanted to bring up are these ones here. So first, field starting amount of Pokemon is not used. And oh yeah, it doesn't look like it's being used, so let's delete this. However, that results into an error because down here we actually are using starting amount of Pokemon. So this is actually pretty interesting because Ryder knows that all we are doing is setting this value to this value, but we will never ever use it again in our code. So to fix this, what we do is we delete it up here and we go down here and delete it. And we will have no more issues because we actually never ended up using that. I just thought that I wanted to use a starting amount of Pokemon, but I never ended up actually using it. Next for the method, Ryder will suggest like, hey, this specific method here called endgame, you're not using that anywhere else. Why don't you make it private? So like, okay, let's make it private, Ryder. Awesome. And then finally, Ryder is suggesting some typos. So Psyduck, according to Ryder, should be st spelled differently, which is quite interesting. Let's see what... Ryder wants us to replace it with, with duck bins. Yeah, I don't think that's a good name for a Pokemon at all. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to go again to the inspection, disable once with comment. And actually I'm just gonna, or actually I'm gonna, oh, if you remove the comment, okay, well, that's not cool, Ryder. We know our Psyducks. So anyways, we are gonna just disable it here and we're gonna disable it in the or we're just gonna disable it for this class and no comment, and there you go. So that will take care of that. And with that, our level manager has no more warnings either. Next up, we have the Pokeball controller. I already did a pass here as well, but there's still 20 warnings left. I've been, I've been uh, a little bit naughty here, I guess. So let's see what we have. So Poke Flash PF, not a great file according to Ryder. What do we wanna do with that? Well. Uh, for a serialized field, Unity wants Poke Flash, uppercase P, lowercase f. I don't really like changing that stuff because if we're going to rename this, we're going to get formally serialized S and then the old name, and then we're going to add this thing here so that Unity can still make sense of what we're writing. I, you know, I should have just named it accordingly from the beginning instead of doing this entire thing. So at this point, I'm like, you know what? It works. Let's not worry too much about it. What we're going to do instead is we are going to go to the inconsistent naming and we are going to disable this for the class. And that will immediately reduce a whole bunch of other naming issues that Ryder found. Clip collision with the underscore is not what Ryder wants to see. So we had to remove that as well. So moving on. Then we have a local variable rigid body that hides property of the Unity Engine component rigid body. So we used to name rigid body here, which is the same as a component that already exists, which could lead to interpretation issues. So what we wanna do is we wanna rename this. And this is the rigid body of, I think our Pokeball, if I am not mistaken. So we are going to rename this to probably rigid body Pokeball. And to do this, Ryder has already highlighted every instance of rigid body that we are referring to. So we can just press backspace and type Pokeball rigid body, something like that. And that should do the trick for us. There we go. So now that's another warning that we don't have to deal with. Just press escape on your keyboard to stop the selection and we can move on. So then we have a string based lookup that is inefficient. So to close the Pokeball, we are going to our Pokeball animator and we're setting the integer of the state and we're using the name state here to value one. Ryder tells us, nope, that's not a good way to do that. Um, the string is just inefficient and it will, it will use up too many resources. So instead, use the cache property index. Like, okay, let's see if that works. I'm not entirely sure if the value of one would apply to the state, but hey, this is something that I'm more than happy to see um, if this actually works and try to figure that out. So I can do it for the wiggle as well. So with that, let's see if this actually works and if Ryder is not just telling us here something that is actually causing a problem in our code. 
Now, this is going to be one of those tests for which I'm actually going to have to hit a Psyduck in the face. So let's see if I can figure it out on the first go. Let's move in a little bit closer. Yeah, I got him. So yeah, the ball closed. The wiggle is working. So yeah, we should have just probably trusted Ryder all along. But, you know, I like to make sure that I'm not getting myself into any issues while I'm doing this. And I think it's a good way to just not get into many problems because if you're going to change all these warnings and all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore there's a lot of stuff to roll back on anyways let's move on we have an explicit string comparison that's inefficient so i am writing here if collision of the tag is equal to pokemon Ryan's like nope you have a method to do this which would be more convenient so convert this to compare tag instead so this is a method that comes with the game object to compare if a tag is on a certain collision so we can use that instead and then we just have a bunch of typos about the Pokeball, which I can't really be bothered with. So again, easy peasy. Let's go to the typo thing, disable once, not with the comment. I'm going to disable it for the entire class. <laughs> um, so whoops. So make sure again that you are selecting the part that has the wiggly green line underneath it. So disable once with the comment. There we go. And just disable for class and that should do it. Um, and then, yeah, we also do it for the typo in the comment with the Pokeball. Um, seriously, Ryder. Oh, it's, it's even doing comments. So, yeah, I mean, you know, great, great, great. We don't want typos anywhere, I guess. But honestly, this is getting a little bit... <laughs> this is feeling... Yeah, this is a little bit too much of meddling that Ryder is doing here, I feel. So, um, all right, let's take care of this one. <laughs> and finally... We are done with the Pokeball controller as well. Which brings us to our Pokemon controller. And I already did a quick pass on this one as well. And most of these warnings that I had, because there were quite a few, are warnings that we've already done before. However, there is one here that I'm going to double click on. Um, because, and well, <laughs> this is already, uh, there was already a warning here that turned this into the question mark semicolon structure instead of the if condition with an else. But um, the other issue with this one was that we are inefficiently using a repeated property. So we are using the transform over and over. So what Ryder wants us to do is like, hey, can you just make a variable instead? So let's make a variable first uh, for position. That's a vector three that's equal to trainer.transform.position. And then we can do position.x instead of trainer.transform.position over and over. And we, Ryder wants us to do that a couple of times because we also want to do that for, um, yeah, we want to do that for this one as well. It gets a little bit weird here, as you can see, because now it's making position one for something that we could just have the same position for, and it's not really calling that one out. So <laughs> that's one of the reasons why I wanted to point this one out. So at this point, what we can do is look for um, these instances and just start copy pasting um, the local variable position instead. So if we just do this and just do that, that should work just as well. And then we can press escape. And yeah, so that will work up here. Let's go down here then. So again, we're making a very similar mistake. Ryder wants us to, or mistake, like Ryder just wants us to introduce a variable instead of continuously re using uh, transform over and over because we're accessing transform and just saving, saving it as a variable. Um, I think with this one, I'm a little less eager to do this thing. So um, I think for this one, I'm just going to call in the, incept the exception and let it be the way it has been. So um, yeah, I'm just going to disable it. Ugh, not with the comments. <laughs> Just keep clicking on that. So in this one, I'm going to go inspection, disable once with comment, disable for class. And there, that takes care of that stuff because I don't want to mess with all that. But this should work just fine. This does look a lot cleaner. Now, I am going to scroll up here because I forgot to mention, every time we suppress a message, uh, Ryder is going to add some C-sharp code. Suppress message, resharper, because um, resharper is the, the software within Ryder that is giving us all these warnings and is giving us the ID that it wants us to no longer do for this specific class. You can do something similar like that for warnings that will pop up in Unity itself by using Pragmas, but that's something that we haven't really run into yet. But um, anyways, just a quick note there. Let's move on to our player control. 
And again, after some passes, I ended up with the following four. So initializing field with the default value is redundant. This is really straightforward, but yeah, why would I write throwing equals false? It's always gonna be false if we're just initializing it. So we can remove the redundant is false statement there. Then we have the order of multiplication operations is inefficient. So that's something that we you know, didn't really consider it that much, but okay, these are nice little tweaks and we actually get to do it twice. So let's reorder our multiplication. And then finally, there's this one. Um, and this is actually not that big of a deal. I mean, it's a question mark colon operator instead to clean stuff up, but this is a visualization of a raycast. When our game is done, we don't really need our debug anymore. So we can just get rid of it that way. So yeah, I, with that, we get rid of all the warnings that Ryder has and it looks like we made some good progress with that and our code is somewhat cleaner for it. Now, even though this has been pretty great and we've got our warning sorted out, that doesn't mean that our code is absolutely perfect at this point, obviously. I mean, I already talked about how an enumerator is not the best way to do a state machine. And similarly, there's a bunch of things that we are doing that is not the best coding practice. For instance, to get the, the texture mix that we are using to figure out where the footsteps are, whether they're on grass or whether they're on sand, we're literally copying and pasting the same code in two classes while we could just as well create a utility class for that stuff. And there's plenty of other issues with the code to really make this a much better structured project. But given that it's a small project with the goal of teaching the API of Unity most uh, mostly, I feel that we can kind of get a pass on that as long as everything's working. So anyways, with that, let's look at some other features and let's see if we can uh, optimize our game a little bit further. So a quick and easy way to do that is by clicking on the stats button here. And this will show us our frame rate and a bunch of other stats while we are running our game. So I'm gonna run the game really quickly. And we can see that we have about 2.2 million tris uh, in the game. We are running, or I'm running at least, at 72 frames per second. I had a quick spike there to around, or drop to 50 frames per second, 40 maybe even, but Overall, I am getting a solid frame rate and I'm really not concerned too much about running this game on this high-end laptop that I'm using for this. You can also see where the audio levels are and they're very low at this point. Um, minus 50 dB is pretty low, so maybe it may be mixed a little bit louder even. But anyways, this gives us a lot of good information about our game, but there's a lot more that we can do to figure out how we can optimize our game in certain spots. So if you've never used the profiler before, you can find it under window analysis and then profiler. And it will open up in a separate window first for me on a separate monitor, but you can just drag it and put it as a tab somewhere. Maybe, yeah, I, I like that as a spot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger and pull it out like so. And this is an application within the editor that will help us figure out where stuff might be going wrong in our game or where we might be able to optimize our code a little bit. So the way it just works is it's recording. You have this record button, so this needs to be on. And if you then start playing your game, the profiler will start gathering data. So let's do that. And as you can see, we're incoming here. And at first there was a big spike and you can see that our game right now is running well, we had a spike of about 30 frames per second. And now as we're playing, we're going up and most of our lowest spikes are around 60 frames per second. But when Pokemon, when, when Psyduck starts running, we drop to 30 again. And now we're, we're back at 60 frames per second mostly. I mean, you can see in the stats that it's actually a little bit higher. And, you know, sometimes it's a single frame that drops to 30 frames per second. So we wouldn't even be able to, to see that. So overall for this machine, this game is running pretty well and, and optimized. Um, so not too many issues right there. Now, what can you do with this profiler if things actually go wrong? And I'll provide a YouTube video with somebody who's really setting a game up for it to be profiled with some major issues in the code, which we don't have here right now. But we can already have a look at how you can figure out what's going on in your game. So first off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to press escape so I get my mouse back. And then I can look for a spike here, like, oh yeah, perfect. Just click in it and then just go to the spike. And we can see what's actually going on here with the hierarchy. So you can see that the time, the milliseconds that have been um, 
yeah, the, the amount of time that it took for stuff to do is mostly by the editor loop. So the editor loop is actually the Unity editor. So this is not our game. We don't really have to worry about it. The player loop, however, that is our game. So four milliseconds is actually pretty solid. Um, and if we open this up, we can see everything that's going on, such as the camera rendering time, which is less than a millisecond, it seems, uh, the GUI updates, and um, we even see our update script runtime behavior here. And that's quite interesting because uh, we took 0 0.14 milliseconds to run uh, our script. So if we open this up, you can see there's our player controller right here. Our player controller uh, contributed to 0 0.06. So that's interesting to know. And there's a raycast that pops up as well here. We know that's the raycast to see if we're close to the ground or if we're grounded or not. And our garbage collector, which is something I'm not going to explain this series, but it's just an amount of data that you're storing. You kind of want to keep that number at zero as you can. We are collecting some garbage left and right. So that might be something to look into if your game is actually going a little bit slow in certain spots. But in a nutshell, this is what you can do with the profiler. You can see what scripts are causing delays and are dropping your frame rates. Now, aside from the profiler that's built into Unity, which I personally prefer to use, you can also use Rider for this. And Rider uh, has options to profile as well. So what you need to do is you need to attach it to your Unity editor by clicking here. And then you can go to this button to see what options that you want to use. And you can edit multiple configurations for it. But usually, you just want to have a timeline Unity. And you click on this button then, press OK. So it's not attached to the Unity editor. What you need to do is you actually want to shut your game down entirely to profile it. Um, and then we click this button again. And then it's going to start the profiling session. And you'll see that Rider is now going to open up the game again for us to profile. So I'm going to fast forward this. And eventually we'll find ourselves in the Unity editor, which will open on top of your Rider screen. So what you can do here is you can press the play button start playing the game i'm going to give it a second here so we're entering play mode this takes a little bit longer than usual and then i'm going to press escape to get my mouse back i'm going to go to rider and i can click on get snapshot once i do that i have my snapshot here with all the information of the duration that it was active which was 60 seconds in this case i can double click it we'll see the entire call tree right here with all the processes that have been running and again, Ryder will point out to us like this is the stuff that has been used the most versus other parts. And we can see if there are some controllers in here maybe um, that will get us. Yeah, well, there's a lot of controllers, obviously, not just the ones that we have been using. Um, let's maybe see if the player controller was active much. Yeah, so in the update for the player controller, we can double click on it. And this is, it took 29 or 6.9 milliseconds out of the 29 milliseconds that it was active. It was working on this specific script. So we can also use Rider in a similar way to figure out directly. And the perk that you have here is that you immediately can just jump into your code and see what was going on. If you see that there is some code that you are using, again, that's not the case right now because everything's looking fine. But you know, if you're at the top here, you're seeing that an update on one of your scripts is being called. You probably want to go double click on it and see what's going on there. Alrighty, so that is how you can profile your game in a nutshell, but I'll provide some further reading so that you can actually look at some use cases where there is a problem in the game that a developer is trying to fix. And with that, I've just paused my recording and I've uh, I've killed a profiler in Rider and I started Unity up again because the next thing that I want to do and we're getting towards the end of this video is show you how to actually build your game and create an executable out of it. So to do that, you go to File, Build Settings, and up here, we already have our start and then our sample scene in the correct order. That's important. And then we can decide what platform that we want to build for, whether it's Windows or PlayStation 4. Um, so this is pretty neat. And um, all we have to do now is just click on Build. And then hopefully, we won't run into too many errors. Now, one thing that you might already notice here as well is it says Auto Connect Profiler and Deep Profiling. To access those things, you actually need to create a development build. And if you do that, it will bake the IP of your Unity editor in there. And you can actually profile on the build itself so that most of the, the milliseconds that are being used up or the frames that are being used up are not from the editor. 
So what I'm going to do now first is I'm going to make a regular build and see if that works. And then we'll get back to the development build part. So let's do that. I'm just going to click on build. I'm going to have to save. And as you can see, I've been messing around with it a little bit already. So I'm going to create a folder. I'm going to call this Psyduck reg build because it's going to be a regular build of our side of game and select folder and then the building process will start now building your game will take a bit of time uh, depending on how many times you've already built the game often uh, i find that building a second time goes a lot faster than building it the first time um, but as you can see unity has a lot of calculation to do and basically compile all the scripts get all the shaders get all the lighting data and package that up as a file that you can run the game from. So I'm going to press the fast forward button here. And oh, actually, well, I've been building this game a couple of times already. So this went pretty quickly. But if you're doing this for the first time, and I recommend that you do this, you should probably expect this to take more than a couple of minutes. Um, but anyways, my build already completed while I was uh, talking and it succeeded in 30 seconds. So that's great. And actually one of the things that I noticed is that there was an error in my build before I went through all the writer warnings that caused an error in the building. So um, this is pretty great. So anyways, what we have now is our build. So I can, I'm gonna delete this folder here actually. That was my test build. I'm gonna open up my side of reg build. It's opening on another monitor and you'll find your executable here. And if we double click that again, it's opening it on the other monitor. But now we have an executable for our Duck Hunt game and everything seems to be working fine. Now, if that would not be the case, however, I'm gonna press Alt and F4, by the way, to get out of this. If that would not be the case, we might wanna do some debugging and some profiling on our actual build. So that's the last bit that I'm gonna explain real briefly. So the first way to do that is to do that with Unity, as I was already hinting at that before uh, I got into this part of the video. So we're gonna to go to the build settings and we're gonna make a development build for that. Auto connect the profiler and do some we don't have to do deep profiling support for this. It'll just eat up more resources and provide more information. I don't think that's too important. We can also do some script debugging if we want on the build, but I just wanna show you how you can hook up the profiler to it. So let's do that now and click on build to create a build. And this is not gonna be a regular build. This is gonna be my dev build. So that path doesn't exist. Well, no, <laughs> of course it doesn't exist. So sci duck dev build here we go double click on that select that folder and we are back to building so i'm going to fast forward it here even though it shouldn't take too much time either and 37 seconds later a little bit longer than a regular build we get our dev build so if i double click this now it's going to ask me well it's going to tell me that the firewall is blocking some features because we're trying to connect to our unity editor so Okay, we've got our game running and I'm gonna alt enter so that I can get back to this version here. And now I'm gonna go back to Unity. Gonna minimize this, get to my profiler. And as I am playing, and this is gonna be a little bit tricky to show you <laughs> on a small monitor, but as I am playing the game, you can see that my profiler is actually working as well because we are connected to window player um, this is the name of my computer and this is the local IP that I have. So what's going on in the profiler right now is actually the game as I'm playing it. So this is a lot easier to do if you have multiple monitors, uh, of course. And as you can see, there's a ton of information here that you can look into. The physics, the audio, the volumes, the memory, uh, the texture memory. That's a really big one as well. And you can use the profiler uh, here actually to disable some of these things so you get the information that you want. And again... We can just go in here and now you'll see there's no editor loop. It's just a player loop and 99% of our game is um, taken up by the player. And we can see here in terms of frames per second, we are well over 60 frames per second. Um, that's that line here. We're probably running now at 90 or something. So we're getting much better frame rates because we are no longer calculating everything that's going on in the editor in this screen here. All right, I'm gonna stop the video here and just clean up my screen for a second. And hocus pocus, I'm back at Rider because now I want to show you how you do the same thing with Rider. So in Rider, to do profiling on your build, you go to Edit Configurations, and then you click on the plus. 
and then you look for Unity and standalone player. And then in here, you can give it a name. I already done this once, obviously. So Cider Game is what I'm going to call it. So I'm going to call it Cider Game. <laughs> um, there's some options that you can do here. Um, in general, all you need to do is get your, uh, your path. So you can just use a regular build for this. It doesn't have to be the dev build. Select it, click on Apply. Okay, and then in here, you click on Psyduck game instead of the Unity editor. And then you can click here to start up. It's happening in a secondary window for me right here. But again, you can get a snapshot and that'll pause the game. You can double click it and you can see what's going on in your game. And now this time you'll see that there is different calls that are being made because we are no longer running the editor and profiling the editor as well. So that's how you profile an executable from within Rider. And with that, we have sadly reached the end of our journey together. I think this is how far I want to take this Pokemon game. And there's a lot of cool stuff that we've done if you look back on it. I mean, hopefully you learned a little bit of C Sharp. You learned how to optimize your game in this particular video. You, you've picked up a couple of tips and tricks on how to debug your game or how to just get some models of the internet, mess around a little bit with them and put them into a pretty cool game. So I hope this helps you on your journey on becoming a better game developer and making your own games because I'm looking forward to playing them. Anyways, that's going to be it for this tutorial series. Hope to see you in another one. Bye-bye. Have a good one.